what is the carnivore diet? That's what I'm here to discuss today. So if you're new to my channel, my name is Christina. I'm a naturopath, herbalist, life coach, and carnivore. And this is the space where I talk about all things uh, health related as well as carnivore related. Uh, so hold on tight, because we're gonna be talking about what is, what is carnivore. So today's video has come out of like people asking me all the time, what is carnivore? What do you mean when you're talking about it? All of that type of stuff. And so for me, when I'm talking about carnivore, I'm talking specifically probably more about standard carnivore. So there's multiple different types of carnivore. There of course is st really strict carnivore, which is basically just meat, salt and water. And it generally includes any type of meat. Then there is what is known as the lion's diet version of carnivore, which is basically ruminant animals, salt and water. Uh, and then there is, um, say, standard carnivore. So standard carnivore is all of your meat, all of your dairy, um, maybe with the exception of milk because the carbohydrates are in, in that are quite high. And um, maybe if you get raw milk. Um, but generally standard carnivore is including animal products, um, not honey and generally not milk. Um, so dairy, eggs, meat, uh, herbs and spices to flavor food with um, and maybe tea and coffee. That's generally what standard carnivore is. Now then there is what is called ketovore, which is where you might include some things like some avocados. Um, you might include some really low carb vegetables in it, but it's not more than say 20 to 30 percent of your actual diet but the the premise is that you're still working to be in ketosis when you are looking at ketovore versus hypercarnivore now hypercarnivore is around 70 percent animal products 30 percent are things that are coming from plants now in a hypercarnivore versus ketovore, what you're really looking at is um, in ketovore, you're really trying to stay low carb and you're trying to stay in ketosis. Whereas when it comes to hypercarnivore, you're less concerned about that and you're less worried about that. Now, you would choose the different versions of that based on a, a whole bunch of different things. One, for example, would be food addiction. So for me, when I chose to go carnivore, I chose standard carnivore because I didn't feel that I needed the strict version of carnivore or that that might be a little bit too hard for me to do without any sort of plants whatsoever. So without any seasonings and those types of things. Although saying that, now predominantly I will go without seasonings, not because I'm trying to go without seasonings, but just because my palate has really changed and um, the food tastes really good for me. So, you know, the other day my, my son cooked some chicken drumsticks. He wanted some seasoning on them. I couldn't care about the seasoning as long as I've got some salt and butter. I'm like super happy just to eat it like air fried and, and done. Um, he's still in the seasoning space because he's still having some non-carnivore foods and so on. So the reason you would choose different things depends on A, your health right now. So for example, I get a lot of clients who've got really significant food allergies where, you know, some of the little people that I work with are basically allergic to their own mother's breast milk and they're hyper allergic to so many things and they've got histamine issues they've got so much that's going on for them and so for those people what we might actually do is start them on the lion's diet version which is where we're looking at ruminant animal meats and then as their gut heals and as their body starts to decompress from all of the inflammatory foods that they've been having we can start to ease them down that spectrum by bringing in a few more animal meats and then being able to bring in things like eggs and dairy and slowly build out um, what they're actually able to tolerate over time. So health, your health will dictate which way you go. But the other thing is uh, different, um, different mental things too. So for me, I chose standard carnivore because when I was looking at them, I thought about going keto and um, I just looked at it knowing that we were about to go and travel. I thought, you know what, it's gonna be much easier for me to just like do away with all of that and not have to count the carbs and actually just go with eating meat and our animal products than it would be for me to really try and stick to under 20 grams of carbohydrates. Now, as I went along my journey, I realized that there was some real wisdom for me personally in that decision, simply because it meant that 
I took away an addiction that I didn't even realize that I had and that was to carbs and so for me having been on this experience nearly a year now um, I have found that even a little bit of those foods so even when I've had a little bit of something it triggers a whole um, a whole thought process in my head where I'm like fixated on like where do I get my next hit from where's that coming from and so it's easier for me to just avoid it completely than it is for me to moderate it and that's where you know the whole discussion around moderators versus abstainers comes in so it's easier for me to abstain than it is for me to moderate uh, and it just takes out a whole heap of stress a whole heap of things that I don't need to worry about I've got lots of stuff going on in my life so you know it's okay for me to miss out on some vegetables and you know things like avocado for example which you know I really enjoyed when I was eating them but um, not so much that the weighing up of like having avocado and it's still triggering uh, food addiction for me it's not worth it so for me at this point in time that's not worth it um, so that's another thing that might come into your decision making process when it comes to deciding on what's the best approach for you at this point in time as a practitioner i look at a whole bunch of different things so i'm going to get my clients usually to do a blood glucose test and a blood ketones test so i want them to have their own little monitor at home so that we can work out what their gki score is and actually have a look at what's happening with their insulin where's their primary fuel source coming from are they tapping into ketones all of that beautiful information to help me figure out at this stage in their life so in for example they might be in the middle of moving they might be in the middle of like changing jobs they might be in the middle of divorce or their kids about to go through something and they're about to have a break or they're about to have dot 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 well it, while they're in the middle of it it might not be the best time for us to take away a primary fuel source and it might be better for us to navigate that primary fuel source first um, versus switching over to to trying to get them to be fat burners really quickly when their body's not not ready to do that so there's a whole heap of decision making processes that come into it for me when i'm working with a client as to where they might need to sit on that that spectrum of of carnivore and low carb high fat keto gaps etc um, so all of that there's lots of moving parts as to why we would would um, choose those things. I have my notes down here, by the way. That's why I'm looking down. Uh, so when it comes to the health benefits, for me, one of the ways that I've explained this to people is essentially that we live in a world that's far more toxic than it has ever been. So right now there are car engines going around me. There is going to be fumes from those car engines. I'm going to be breathing them in. 300, 400, 1,000 years ago, centuries before that ago, um, or millennia before that ago, those car fumes weren't around. There are other toxins, but they weren't to the extent. So this is just one thing. I'm sitting outside a library. There is EMFs coming from that library with you know the Bluetooth, and uh, even my own phone has got some of those things. My car apparently releases EMFs as well. Like everything around us has got some toxic load in it if you've just painted your house for example there's going to be a lot of off gassing from the fumes of that that paint uh, if you've just brought a new couch or put in new carpet all of those provide off gassing and that's a higher level of toxicity now that's without even talking about our food so if we we look at the foods that we're eating a majority of people are going to be consuming a diet that let's say you're eating fruits vegetables and meats are going to have a diet that's going to have a lot of um, toxins within those foods just simply in the growing process unless you're like super mega rich grow your own food whatever where you're able to produce all of your food um, out without conventional growing methods and uh, farming practices you're very rare you're very lucky to be in that situation and celebrate you go you but majority of the population are not in that space where they can afford to do that 100% of the time which means that they are going to be consuming chemicals within their food source now we have chemicals as well in our toothpaste in our deodorants in our shampoos in our soaps um, there is a lot of spaces where we can be receiving toxins that we didn't have a long time ago so we live in a world that's far more toxic than it's ever been before and we now have got more and more 
things like gene mutations that are taking place, more and more challenges within our immune system, et cetera, et cetera, because we live in a global climate. Even just the fact that we live in a global climate versus uh, the local climate that we used to live in. So for example, if we were in a small town, we would more likely just catch the, the diseases that are around in that small town. And maybe occasionally somebody would come from another location and bring something else in and everyone would get it. And everybody would get you know an immune boost from that. And hopefully some people, did not die and which occasionally you know definitely actually happened um etc etc well now we live in a global cli climate we can have people coming from different parts of the world and not even just different parts of neighboring um areas and locations and so because of that what we're actually getting is more exposure to different germs and bugs and those types of things so there's more immune stuff that's actually going on there we transport our food. So food that we used to only get in our local environment, now we're getting food from different countries, different areas of the same country, all of which will be bringing with it some type of um, different pollens, different bacteria, different all of those types of things, which will, again, will, will test our immune systems out. And so we live in a world that's far more toxic than it's ever been before. And we might even have a job that's highly toxic. And so when I'm explaining this to clients, one of the things that I'm explaining to them is that we want to do all the things, right? We want to get rid of the toxins within our household. We want to reduce those. We want to go as clean and green as we possibly can. Uh, we want to reduce the toxins that we're exposed to. We want to do some beautiful things like detoxification, earthing, um, helping our bodies, you know, process toxins by Epsom salt baths, uh, increasing fats, all of those types of things. We want to definitely do all of those. But one of the big places that we can have a massive impact is by reducing the amount of challenges that are within our diet. And so from the carnivore perspective, all fruits and vegetables are likely to contain some type of plant chemical or defense mechanism. So if we think about it from the perspective of if you wanted to go and hunt a deer, then that deer has mechanical defense mechanisms. It has the ability to smell you. It's got really good hearing. Um, it is has got um, a very rapid response system. So you can usually scare them very easily. Um, they've got mechanical defense mechanisms where they could run away. If you're close enough, they could attempt to charge or kick or hurt you in some mechanical way. Whereas plants can't do that. Like that broccoli that you're thinking about eating that's in the garden, it can't go, oh, they're coming and they're to get me. I'm going to like, you know, do some type of mechanical defense mechanism. It can't. It can't pick up its roots and run away from you. It can't do any of those things. And there really isn't anything on this planet other than your mother that would willingly sacrifice itself in order for you to live. And so plants don't necessarily want you to eat them either. They want to live. Everything has this vital energy of, of survival and life. And so from that perspective, that plant that can't pick up its roots and run, run away, it has to create some type of defense mechanism. And that defense mechanism of plants are, is an internal one. It's a stand in place defense mechanism. Uh, it's biochemical stand in place and it's attempt to save itself and protect itself from bugs and anything else that's trying to harm it or eat it is to release chemicals. And those plant chemicals can be very toxic to us. You know, we know this in, in a whole bunch of different things. So we know, for example, don't go and eat red berries when you're walking around in the bush because it might be just be one that's going to kill you. Uh, and there's a whole heap of ones that we know are absolutely, you eat it and you die straight away. But the accumulation of some of these plant chemicals over time can create significant issues for a lot of the population. They just don't necessarily know it. And so from that perspective, if we need to reduce the amount of toxins that we're actually having because we've got more in our system, more in our world and more in our life than ever before, then one of the spaces is to reduce the amount of plants that are coming into your actual diet as well. And again, depending on how toxic your life is and how much you're able to do would depend on how much on that spectrum that I talked about before where on that spectrum you might not actually need to be. So for some people, they live in, they work a really toxic job. And so for them, they benefit far more from being super clean with a carnivore diet um, than say somebody who, if they were trying to eat say hyper carnivore or, you know, just a standard type of diet where they're getting, you know, grains and wheat and all of that type of stuff coming in. And so somewhere on that spectrum is often where people need to lie. 
And for me, it's about taking in a whole bunch of different factors as to where on that spectrum they need to be. Some people are really happy just to be in the, the carnivore space or the lion's diet space without there necessarily being a need for that to actually happen because they feel good. They feel happy there. It's simple. It's easy. It's clean. It's all of those things and it makes life, you know, a little bit easier for them. They don't have to think about anything. Other people need a little bit more variety and that's going to depend again on their personality typing as to what they actually need as well. And so for me, when I look at these uh, dietary protocols, I think about them from this spectrum perspective as to, and why we need to be where we need to be is based on a whole bunch of different things, including your personality. So for me, I have a personality that requires quite a bit of adventure. Now, what that means is if my life was boring as all heck, if I was doing the exact same thing every day, then I'm going to go looking for adventure in ways in my life. And that's usually going to be things like food. And so often when I find people who struggle with a boring diet is what they would call just eating carnivore. Um, what I find for them is that their life is not adventurous enough for their personality typing. And I highly encourage them to go and look for some adventure, seek out some adventure, go do some things that you've never done before, sign up for a class that you've never been on before so that you're filling up your adventure cup and it doesn't have to come solely from your food. But also be exploring, explore different ways to make things. Like there are plenty of amazing cooks out there that are carnivore that are using things like egg whites to make bread. I saw one today who's, she's standard carnivore. So she made um, egg white bread and then made that into French toast with, you know, eggs and some cinnamon uh, and turned that into French toast. Yay, go her. Like, I'm just not that, you know, I don't have the kitchen set up to do that, but also it's not, my life is so, so adventurous that I don't need to be that adventurous in my actual diet. But if you're struggling, that could be an area to actually do that with. So there are many benefits and many reasons why somebody would jump on the carnivore diet. One of which is weight loss. Um, for me, I started the protocol not for weight loss, but you know, I was hoping, yes, let's have some weight loss. But my real, the real drive for me was to actually reverse diabetes and to get into remission when it came to diabetes because I was obscenely, um, my blood glucose was obscene in the sense that it was very, very high. Uh, I should have maybe gone to hospital and been hospitalized with some of those blood glucoses that I was having. Um, but I didn't want to make that choice. I wanted to make a different choice. And so I therefore needed to make a radical uh, decision to transform. And so what I did was I chose carnivore because I knew that that would give me the results that I wanted as quickly as I possibly could get them um, and get me into that safe zone of not having to be like, oh, I really should be going to a hospital, but mm, I don't want to. I want to do this medication free. So I knew that carnivore would be the way to get me there as quickly as possible so that I had more room to actually uh, figure everything else out and, um, you know, have time to actually start to reverse some of the deeper stuff that was there like metabolic systems being out of balance and so for me um, that's why I started but then I had a whole heap of other side effects that were super amazing like I've so far lost about 42 kilos um, which is around about uh, something like 90 92 pounds um, off the top of my head, it could be slightly different because I haven't looked at the numbers. Um, my hair has regrown, so I've got far more hair. And I used to have like this big, massive, bald patch. You can still see it's a little bit thin there, but it actually used to be completely bald there. So I have hair that is now grown in spaces where I didn't have hair before. Uh, I used to have to wear glasses all of the time to be able to do my life. I don't wear glasses anymore. Um, I thankfully have now tucked them away somewhere where I know where they are because I was like, Ugh. even if I need them, I have no idea where they are uh, because my eyes just improved so much that um, wearing them actually caused me more problems than not wearing them anymore. And I'm yet to go and get tested again, but it's on my cards. It's on my list of things to do at some point in the future to get retested. Um, weight loss, of course, is definitely one of them. Um, people will do it for all sorts of different reasons. And some of those can be because they really want to build build muscle and they want to bulk up um, having a high protein diet so we would change the ratios of your diet um, so fat and protein ratios we would change those around a little bit um, based on the goals that you actually have and your uh, health issues at this point in time so for example if you're in a state of uh, long-term chronic fatigue then we might bring in a little bit of carbohydrates and we'll look for our animal products that are going to have those in them uh, and boost those a little bit so that we can 
support your adrenal system as it moves into repair and restorative phase. Uh, but that's essentially, we're going to change those around based on the actual goals that you actually have as well. Uh, so weight loss is one of them. Diabetes is another one. Autoimmune conditions is another because it retrains your immune system to not attack itself so much. And I've been seeing some fantastic results from that perspective. Reproduction, detoxification. Um, I can't really think of anyone who has a condition that didn't actually see some improvements when it came to carnivore or somewhere along the spectrum of carnivore uh, to help them with that. Supplementation. Now, people will ask me about this all of the time. Personally, I only supplement with a very few things, um, and that is things like electrolytes. So especially when I know that my body's doing a lot of cleansing and deep-seated cleaning and you know, I'm dropping weight really rapidly, which is what I'm doing at the moment with my quest um, in, in resolving insulin resistance. So I'm losing weight really quickly. I'm going to be taking electrolytes during that period of time. But generally speaking, when I'm not doing something and I'm not putting my body into large amounts of stress or in really hot areas, I'm not taking anything. Um, occasionally, every so often, I will take some iodine uh, just to give me a little bit of an iodine boost. Um, but that's generally it for me. When I'm looking at supplementation, I really am looking at um, what specifically does that individual actually need to catch them up? Because often when people come to work with me, it's because they have got some type of chronic health issues. So I'm going to look at their nails and their tongue and their eyes and actually see what are the signs and symptoms that your body is telling me that it's deficient in. So that we can catch those up and get you on this healing journey as quickly as possible. But the goal for me is never for those supplements to be a long-term actual tool. They're really a scaffold to help you pick up. And once you've picked up, we drop out that scaffold and off you go. That's generally my perspective when it comes to using supplementation. There's a period of time to use it, um, but ideally, if I'm doing the right thing and you're doing the right thing, then we should get to a point, unless there is some type of long-term health issue, like you've had an accident, you've had an organ removed, um, you've been born with like some type of um, issue there where we will always need to probably supplement something because of those long-term things. Generally speaking, if you're reasonably healthy and well, uh, the likelihood is we can get off of a lot of those supplementations. Um, and that's my goal. That has always been my goal as a practitioner, no matter what dietary protocol I was using with people, was to get them to the point where supplement was for a period of time, but it was never the forever Thing. It was never the, we do this forever and a day, because if we are doing it forever and a day, we're not actually resolving what's going on there. We're just continuing to band-aid it. Um, and some people can choose to do that. Like that's a valid choice that some people like to make in their own lives. It's their choice, but I want them to know that there is another choice. Okay, so the last thing on my list is, a, is something that people commonly ask about, and that is constipation. Uh, am I gonna be constipated because I'm not eating fiber? Well, the truth is you don't need fiber to poo. And if you do need fiber to poo, then it's because your muscles aren't doing their job properly. They're not doing their job effectively. So if you think about the digestive system, it is this long pipe of muscular, um, muscular processes. And it's this process of this peristaltic motion of squeezing. So the pipe squeezes here, then the next bit squeezes. And along that, that pipe goes the actual poo. It's not the fiber pushing it down, it is the muscles doing the squeezing that's pushing it down. And so if you need fiber, it's because these muscles aren't doing this action properly. They're not strong enough. They've probably gotten weak and lax because they haven't been used because they've had so much fiber that's coming through. It's kind of like the Play-Doh machine where you put the Play-Doh in one end and you press the thing and it pushes it out the other end through the pipe. Well, that's how most people have been using fiber in their diet, where they've been pushing things through their digestive system versus this motion of moving the muscles, which means that two things happen. One, the muscles get lax. Two, they get undernourished because it's this squeezing motion where all of the villi and the microvilli come in contact with the food and the climb and the poo and as it moves along that draws in the nutrients and so if this isn't happening and we've just got this pushing motion then we're not getting as much of contact of the villi and the microvilli with the actual climb or the poo or the food depending on where it is in the actual digestive system um, 
and so we're not getting as much nutrition out of the beautiful things that we might actually be eating and so fiber is you know stopping two of those processes are actually happening and so some people will experience a little bit of constipation when they first start usually i find it's because we need to clean out the pipes uh, because they might have compacted poo so poo is on the sides of the wall but stuff still moving through the middle but it's still hanging out on the sides and what's hanging out on the sides is going to change the microbiome of the gut and it's also going to stop you from getting a nice good clean pipe and so we sometimes have to do some pipe cleaning uh, and clean that all out and there's a couple of tools that I use with my clients for that um, then the other thing is that often people are under eating fat because we've lived in this world where fat has been vilified and we've said we've heard that it's bad it's evil it's gonna make you fat and all of those things and so therefore people have really withdrawn from eating fat and even though they think they're eating high fat they're actually often not eating enough fat um, and especially for women that's what I'll find a lot of that a lot of them aren't eating enough fat and we have to go through that process of refeeding them and lifting up their fat to to a higher extent get everything moving properly and then we can start to actually drop that down a little bit um, but generally speaking having enough fat is a key component to not having some constipation but truth be told majority of people who would go from say a standard diet and switch over to a carnivore diet are gonna have what we call a uh, muddy butt which is essentially they're less likely to have constipation and they're more likely to have diarrhea from anything from 14 to 21 days that's usually how long it takes for the microbiome to start to switch over and change over and by that point then they've actually um, started to they've cleaned out their pipes and they're actually starting to do normal poos now it might be that they don't necessarily poo as much as they were previously pooing but the key thing I usually will say to my clients is do you feel like you need to poo when it's not coming or are you just noticing that you're not pooing as much but you don't feel like you need to either because when you're eating a animal-based diet specifically you're eating something that's maybe 100% carnivore for example then you're going to be able to absorb a lot more of that food because there isn't any non-soluble parts unless you're eating bones there's no non-soluble parts but to that if you're eating a carrot there's going to be insoluble fiber stuff you cannot digest and you cannot bring into your actual body meat doesn't have that it doesn't have insoluble parts same with eggs it doesn't have insoluble parts uh, and so therefore you can absorb a lot more of that which means that in that digestive system there's likely to be a lot less um, things to actually come out the other end because you're absorbing a lot more of it so the key thing I usually will tell people is check in do you feel like you need to poo and it's not coming or do you notice that you're doing less but you actually don't feel like you need to poo and those are some of the things that I'll play around with when I'm asking clients and they're messaging about, about constipation etc so there we go I hope you have the most amazing day if you do have any other questions or any other topics you'd like me to delve into um, I'd love to talk about them leave them below make sure you leave me a like and a subscribe and uh, I'll talk to you again soon bye for now see you later